woman with glasses and her brown hair scraped back because it's a very hot day sitting in front of a flower painting in her living room and I'm going to share my screen with you now. So everyone can see that? Yep, excellent. Right. So this talk is called The Autistic Alice or How I Recognize the Autistic Girl in the Looking Glass. Um, the Autistic Alice is my most recent book of poems and it's named after the sequence, The Autistic Alice, um, which I used post-diagnosis, which I didn't get till I was 42, to try and re-recognize and sort of, um, I suppose, um, reclaim myself as the autistic girl I had been without knowing it. And I'm thinking about how literature can function both for the writer and a reader as a looking glass in which you can begin to recognize yourself. So, as I said, literature is a tool of self-recognition. I'm gonna start with an earlier poem. Um, and the image on this screen is a cover of the artist Helen Chadwick's work a cover of the study of her work, Ego Geometrica Sum, in which she projected pictures of herself at different times of her life onto boxes. So for example, that there, there's a bed shape and there's a wigwam shape and there's um, a chest of drawers shape, just how she's sort of slotted into different shapes that were available to her or forced on her at different times in her life. And I had a dream about it, which became this poem, which I wrote in my mid twenties. So some 25 years before diagnosis and it's called Autodilography. Part one begins with a rosy plastic baby whose tiny tears I wipe while mum nurses my new brother. Five years on a torture scene. I interrogate the doll my grandma gave me that Hanukkah she died. I ask why this should be and pull a cord. Please brush my hair she says, and other useless things. So I dismember her piece by piece. This is a start of a long vendetta. I declare a war on all dolls, the snide lying bitches with their bodies with no openings, with their eyes that never close, with their mouths always smile. See how the more I scratch them, throw them, scribble on them, the more I hurt them for being stupid, the more they so despicably smile. But by part two, I've grown up and learnt what every girl should know, that dolls are the perfect decoys to cover any retreat. And so we've come to terms. They answer my phone, take my place at the office, sit cross-legged in pubs laughing at people's jokes. They're so good at it, with their even tempers, their small talk and those indelible smiles. No one need ever know what a nasty girl I am. Not while I hide in my toy box, upside down and scribbled on. And it's obvious in retrospect that that's a poem about masking and the suppression of one's autistic characteristics. And it came into my head when I had the conversation I had here, which I had while I was writing The Autistic Alice. And I said to someone, um, a literature uh, professor, I said, I've been wondering what it would mean to write from the perspective of an autistic subject. And then she said, but weren't you always writing from that perspective? And as you can see from that poem, obviously I was, but it's one thing to not know what you're writing about. It's another thing to identify yourself as a member of a community and to address that shared experience. So with the Autistic Alice, I was doing that knowingly. And so in order to recognize and reconstruct my autistic earlier selves creatively, rather than for example, through a therapeutic process, I turned to my established practice as a poet. I'd published two poetry books and some other books by then, and to a childhood special interest, if I must call it that, or passion, Lewis Carroll's Alice books. So um, th this is an image of me age three with my younger brother sitting in the living room. So that's what I looked like at the time I discovered this book. And that's the edition of the book I discovered. It's a 1960s edition of Martin Gardner's The Annotated Alice, which has both Alice books, Wonderland and Looking Glass, with annotations down the side of the pages by Martin Gardner, looking at the history, the biography, um, mathematical problems that were referenced by Lewis Carroll, who was a mathematician, philosophical problems and so on. And 
I loved it just for the pictures when I was small and later on it had all these facts and um, uh, I suppose uh, diversions and they were absolute catnip to my thirsty brain. And I also like Tenniel's Alice, the illustrator of the book, because if you look at her, she, she, she's got that, that very blank face. And it's a face that one often has in an, as an autistic person when one isn't marking, masking. It looks kind of rather blank to other people and perhaps even forbidding. And I identified with that face and also the fact that, and this might refer to Lewis Carroll's own experience, the way Alice moves through these arbitrary fantasy worlds She's, she's very logical and she's very curious. So she's this curious, logical child moving through an arbitrary neurotypical world. And I'm gonna read some of those poems to you now. So the only poem in the first person and the last poem in the collection, but I'll read it first, is called The Autistic Alice and it tells the story of how I found her. Special interests, I love books mostly books with other worlds in them. When I was three, I would ask my mother to take the annotated Alice down for me so I could see the pictures. I was drawn by that other girl with the unsmiling, level look. She had adventures. My mother told me how she fell for miles but wasn't hurt, made friends with a vanishing cat, grew and shrank and grew, but whatever her size, stayed curious. She said I was curious too. I asked a lot of questions. One day I asked what would happen if I went through the looking glass. Would I go like Alice into another world? No, she said, I'd wake up in hospital being mended. And I was so disappointed. I never meant to stay forever on the nonsense side. So most of the other poems are in the third person and there's something about that distance. Um, putting myself in the third person and calling myself Alice that gave me the distance to recognize myself. If you think about the um, looking glass metaphor, if you're right up against, you can't see yourself. If you stand back, you can. And this is a black and white photograph of me, age three. I'm standing in our back garden in front of French windows. You can see there's a clump of daffodils next to me and there's a rotary clothesline on the right. And this poem's called Alice's Unbirthday, and it was mostly straight autobiography, but I used the idea of the unbirthday from the Mad Hatter's Tea Party. Alice is three and she knows it. She's sitting face to face with daffodils underneath the washing line, which is a roundabout for clothes. Her mother pegs some clothes up, gives them all a ride and pegs again. Alice feels like trying something. I'm four, she says. No, you're not, her mother says, you're three. She picks Alice up and pegs her to this rule. It isn't saying it that makes it true. I remember that as an experiment in reality. I was trying to see if I could change it by what I said, but it didn't work. And so in this one, Alice in reception class, this is straight autobiography, and these are coloured shapes on the slide, randomly placed. They're coloured spodges and you'll see why they're there. Alice in reception class. The papers waiting on the easel. Brushes in the pots, heads down. They know how to do it here and so does Alice. Blue strip makes the sky on top. Green strip lays grass along the bottom. All the space between is hers. House in it, tree, lady, no. First line up what's in the pots. Splodge goes yellow, orange. Splodge the red, the green. Splodge the blue, blue, blue. Teacher here. That's very good. What is it? Splodges, Alice says, because they are. Oh, the teacher sounds upset. She goes. Alice watches colour dance. Another teacher, different voice, same words. That's very good. What is it? Fireworks, tries Alice to be kind this time. Lovely, says the teacher. Alice notes, the answer they want isn't what it is, it's what it isn't. So this is the first slide where I have a picture of Tenniel's illustration and it's Alice grown giant and shoved very uncomfortably into a room which she fills. And this next poem, Big Alice, is also set at school, but I was using uh, the, the sort of image of Alice growing and shrinking because there's something about being 
unfeasibly large you, you you feel conspicuous which you do as an autistic child and your proprioception your sense of where you end when you're autistic isn't that great either so without meaning to or even knowing Alice has grown huge again it starts with her name in an angry voice look what you've done since when were her hands so far away one stuck on her face and covered in ink the others on the desk by the upended carton with milk seeping out. Don't just look at it, pick it up. Alice does, but something's wet somewhere. She's got it all over her skirt. Alice finds her feet and stands on them. The scrape of her chair is thunderous and rude. Go to the office, get a change of clothes. Eyes watch her thudding damply to the door. The dumbest Alice lump they ever saw. I hope that wasn't difficult for people. It occurs to me that the experience of being bullied either by teachers or by students is unfortunately very common for autistic girls, whether they're diagnosed or not. And with that in mind, this next poem in the Garden of Live Flowers is about that horrible teenage phase when you don't fit in. And this is a chapter from Looking Glass where Alice talks to some rather supercilious and bitchy talking flowers and um this is a poem where i took quite a lot from the text of, of um carol because it was already all there and there's an image on the screen of alice talking to these nasty flowers in the garden of live flowers tiger lily violet rose all bloom where they were planted content with themselves so pretty poor alice she tries hard but never really takes. Tiger Lily, the kindest flower, says she's a good colour. If you could only make your petals curl a little more. Violet Rose say nothing to her face, but Alice hears their rustling asides. If I had petals like Alice's, <laughs> they snigger. She's a byword to Violet and Rose, a joke that runs from bed to bed. She knows it too, she's not stupid. But you look it, Tiger Lily says. Alice, we're all flowers here. We're living in a garden. And how we look is everything we are. And a lot of you who were, had the experience of being um, girls in a mainstream school may have had a helpful Tiger Lily who sort of set you straight and told you off a bit. And it was both painful and valuable. So this next one is um, it's a picture of 10 years illustration of Alice tiny Alice this time, shrunk and, and swimming in a sea of tears. And this is the only poem in the second person. And it's, I said things perhaps I would have liked someone to say to me that I might have found helpful. And in this, I blended images from both of Carol's books. Alice, people are not curiosities for you to stare at. They see you seeing them. They see you back. People are not chess pieces to be moved from square to square. They will not stay where you have put them. They are not lessons to be learned or verse to be recited. They are not information. You can't have them by heart. Alice, they're not just figures in your dreams. They have their own and you might not be in them. There's no symmetry, no equity, no caucus race. You could swim an age in tears, then run yourself bone dry and still be left without a prize. Alice, mind you don't confuse your prepositions. You should be in love with, not at. So this next uh, slide, Al Alice's walk has an illustration not from the book, but it's a cartoon of a woman trying to balance and wobbling around on a half sphere. And a lot of the poems in it, as, in it, as you can see, are about social encounters. But this one is about autistic embodiment and again, feeling not quite right in one's body. And it's called Alice's Walk. If you could feel, as Alice does, how fast the earth is moving. If your bones shuddered at the grinding forward thrust of it. If you, had such, if you sometimes had to keep running just to stay in place. If you feared the ground might throw you like a horse its rider, if you knew a foot placed here or there meant life or death, then you wouldn't need to ask her why she walks that way. And this next one, which has a picture of raindrops on water, 
Alice's Antism is about autistic joy, which we should never leave out of any discussion of autism. Ground is home to her. It's where her gaze can come to rest, take stock of what has never changed, the rainbows in the gutter, the points and circles of the pouring rain, the pavement's long squared shoulder. And every summer the ants turn up shiny black and perfectly themselves, bringing out the ant-shaped joy by which she knows she's Alice still because I found that my response to these tiny things in the world around me, that joy and intense experience of them hasn't changed. And that's a line that runs from me to that little girl next to the daffodils. But of course, I couldn't stay as that little girl. And this is an illustration of Alice with a crown on her head next to the red and white queens from the last section of uh, Through the Looking Glass when Alice gets to the end of a chessboard and becomes a queen and she says I did not expect to be a queen so soon and then the red queen and white queen Im immediately start on her about how she has to behave now that she's a queen and the red queen of course has been nagging at Alice at various points all the way through the book and is possibly based on um, the real Alice, Alice Liddell's governess. So this is about successful masking and it's called Queen Alice. She did not expect to be a queen so soon or ever, but somehow there is a crown upon her head and Alice must act up to it. The Red Queen has left instructions, keep washed, keep combed, wear what women like you wear, secure a partner for the dance, remember eye contact, smile when they smile, when they look sad, look sad. Alice stands up straight. She moves her face until it feels like someone else's. Then she hits the high street, smiling, practicing her singing queenly voice on all the shop assistants. With time, it rings less false. With years, she even fools herself. She finds a king. They claim their castle, which they decorate and fill with white goods. She births a little prince, wheels him to queenly coffee mornings, where she talks, like other queens, of kings and princes, high school clothes, holidays and in-laws, castle decoration, the purchasing and breakdown of white goods. She's done well. People meet a queenly face and think it's really hers. And after so long, she thinks they might be white and want right and wonders if she only dreamed that other awkward one. But if she did... Who's that in the looking glass? Who says that unsmiling, sideways stare? Well, I think like a lot of autistic people, I don't know if it's something to do with peripheral vision. I tend to look side on quite often. So this is the last of the poems. And I like to end with this one because it ends on a note of positive defiance. And it's called Alice and the Red Queen. And the image is of Alice standing in front of the Red Queen in the garden where the nasty flowers were, at the beginning as through the looking grass. And you can see the Red Queen is pointing her finger 